Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa. I am so glad you're here with me. We've got a great show today. You gotta say, sound quality wasn't great in this interview, but it is still so worth hosting. This week, it's another topic that relates to how people can struggle in the bedroom, right? How people end up burdened in the bedroom instead of able to enjoy really easy intimacy with each other. And the topic, in a way, is trauma. And specifically, how that can show up in access to our full sensory sort of ladder that my guest is going to talk about, our ability to connect all the way from top to bottom, from our head, our thinking brain, our emotional and social connection, through our core around uh, fight or flight and arousal and connection, and then through our genitals at the ground uh, level of this ladder. You know, can they all be integrated and all available to us when we connect intimately with the partner? And for any number of reasons, people can struggle with this, and trauma is one of the big ones. So my guest, Cass Byron, is here to talk about that structure, that phenomenon, and then some of the ways people can work and approach this to sort of reintegrate everything and then use it in play with their partner. She's really going to emphasize the importance of play and flexibility. So she's sort of singing my song here in terms of let's break out of the mold, break out of the binary, break out of the the, the limiting beliefs we may have about what sex can be and experience play and curiosity and variety and flexibility in order to create you know, our best possible sex life with a partner or partners. And really, from my point of view, to help you be an easily intimate couple instead of burdened and blocked from that enjoyment together. So here's my guest, Cass. I hope you can make out the audio well enough to take it, you know, to really take to heart this wonderful content she has to share. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. So, Kathy, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, so glad to be here, love. So glad. So, um, could you start by just talking a little bit about you and how you've gotten into this work? You know, why it is your your path? Absolutely. Well, my name is Cass. I use she they pronouns, and I'm a queer woman who kind of always found myself in this work even as a child always had a lot of questions about how bodies work and always a very social child so I think I just kind of fell into knowing being a seeker of all this knowledge and then of course being that like obnoxious kid who was always informing some friend about something and then it really started to solidify when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Sub-Saharan Africa and I was doing condom demonstrations every single day of the week and talking about sex in a country where it was so taboo for so many different reasons. And, uh, now I'm, now I'm working with private clients and in a high school and worked in foster care before that co-ran a safe house for human trafficking and sex trafficking survivors. So really talked about sex in so many different settings. Yeah. Yeah. So what is, I mean, what is trauma sensitive sex? Like, it sounds like, I mean, it seems like three simple words, <laughs> but, you know, explain the concept to me a little bit and to the listeners and the importance of it. Yeah. So 
Before I get started, I just want to like tell myself, you and the listeners, when eventually this is listened to, to take a deep breath. You know, we're going to be talking about some sensitive subjects. I'm going to bring up, you know, history of trauma and how it links to how our bodies function during sex. And so just, you know, reminding the listener to take care of them. Yeah. <laughs> you right? Right, right. <laughs> so just check in with your tension in your body and if it, there is any and just relax and hopefully listen. Okay. So I became obsessed with learning about the vagus nerve polyvagal theory. And at the same time that I was thrown into my trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy training, I was taking it in New York City and it was paid for for okay. foster care. So, you know, we've got some good policies coming in. There is. Right. And so I was in the middle of that while also um, working in foster care and really seeing the different ways in which like trauma impacts others' abilities to function. Um, and so that sort of translated to this like deep dive of what is trauma sensitive sex and really teaching how understanding of the different nervous system states that are present when we have sex and how they interact, I think can build better sex lives, better marriages better relationships, just all of it, you know, the cure all for everything, <laughs> every orgasm. but that's really sort of, you know, the foundation of how I work um, and how I teach. I think therapists, I think we're teachers. I think that would be fair to say. I think so. Yes. <laughs> we teach you about your brain and how to organize it. So for me, it's about giving that knowledge to people. Um, and I can go into more of that if you'd like, but that's, that's okay for me. Yeah, no, I think that would be really useful to talk a little bit about, I mean, a crash course, I guess, and how, how is trauma likely to show up in some of these systems? And yes. you know, where, where might, what might the healing look like? What, what, how, mm. how would things function if, if we've approached it properly? Yeah. So just for some context, I was a child of two military parents, moved all over. And my mom is probably a mix of Miss Frizzle from Magic School Bus. <laughs> And Frankie from Grace and Frankie. So just contextually for you to understand right. for the listeners, <laughs> like that's who was responsible for raising me. And so that's why I have this like really unique view of sex. So the idea is that we've got different nervous system states. So I'll start with this and then I'll teach the trauma sensitive sex along the way. So at the top of our polyvagal ladder by Deb Dana, which is a great resource. We have our social emotional connection and that's where we read people's face cues. We can tell by if their eyes are scrunched or not, how they're feeling, right? right. So we read faces. Um, so that's ideally we're there when we're having sex, right? We're socially connected. We're intimate. We're able to hold eye contact. So we're at the top of our ladder. Then we move down to our fight flight area right? This is our torso. I'm gesturing to the torso. I was going to say, I can see you gesturing because we have the video on at the moment. But <laughs> So it's what, you know, that's where all this energy is stored, right? This is where the muscles would either engage to flight, to run away or to fight. Yeah. And, right. And so that's all this energy. And, and that is blood flow. That's where we are during sex. We're activated. Our heart rate's going, we're breathing heavily. We're Hopefully we're reading in sync with a partner that can change how our bodies react, right? And then at the bottom of the ladder in our genitals between our hips is the freeze response. Freeze is probably more common in a body with a vulva, the freeze of that orgasm and then that like riding it. Whereas like uh, a body with a penis has way more jerky sort of orgasms and less time in the freeze response. So then during an orgasm, we're technically in all three states at the same time. Oh, okay. So it's not a matter of we're in one of these. Ideally, we're engaged from top to bottom of the ladder. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And sex can often start sometimes bottom up, right? Genital touching and then the activation and then the desire. And sometimes it's the desire, the activation, and then, you know, penetrative sex or digital toys, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think when it really started to shift for me is when I was taking a course, the polyvagal orgasm with Laura Geiger, 
And she said, well, you can tell a lot about your body's health by your ability to orgasm because you can tell which nervous system is having trouble connecting during sex. Uh huh. Just like, <sighs> Alone. You know, that sex could tell us so much about how we're physically feeling. Right, um, because we're either accessing the whole ladder, what parts are online, what parts aren't. That's sort of what you're indicating. Now, is, I would imagine, is that true just an orgasm or is that the entire sexual encounter that we can... Oh, I'd say we go in and out of all three during, just yeah. throughout the day, especially during a sexual encounter. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sure. Okay. So what does it look like for something? I mean, there's not one way I'm sure, but <laughs> how is trauma going to show up? Is it an impediment to some of this or what's going to, you know, what kinds of things will people experience where this, they don't have access to the whole ladder? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where I know you've done interviews with, oh my gosh, I'm blinking on her last name, Emily Nagoski. Yeah. 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 It's about understanding where you're stressed and how you hold it. So I can tell, oh, I'm stressed because I'm holding tension here or I don't have awareness in this part. It's getting curious about your own trauma to really understand how it shows up in your sex life. You know, lack of desire. That may be trauma here that needs to be. And then... Meaning you're indicating your head, the top of the ladder here. (laughs) Yeah, the top of the ladder, right? That's a lot of your thought patterns. But then also really challenging, I think, one, the Western idea that everything has to be top down. Oh, I'm so bored with that rhetoric. <laughs> you know, you can do things from the bottom up, right? Right. You right. Show, you know, movement medicine. I mean, the way that you feel after you go for just a walk is enough to talk about bottom up processing all day long. Right, right. You know, we can use the body to cultivate things at the top of our processing ladder. Our most important thing, our new addition, our prefrontal cortex. You know, no <laughs> wonder we have our things that's so new. Yeah. The Buzz Lightyear of like brain, but like, you know, bottom up can be really powerful too. That's why I talk about masturbation as a tool for sort of some of, some of that healing for trauma, because I think trauma is really held in the physical form, the fascia, the muscles. And so working with, you know, presence and communication in sex, sex with yourself, masturbation can be a really powerful tool. for Yeah. Yeah. And I want to go there in just a second, but so just so I understand trauma sensitive sex, like what, what do you mean by that term then? I mean, I think it's about integrating all these different bodies of knowledge into your sex life and how it works for your body. I reject the paradigms of relationships that this happens at the three-year mark and this happens at the 10-year mark. Relationships are made by people and people are vastly diverse. And so for me, it's about understanding your trauma and your partner partner's trauma and then making that how you have sex and then bringing that to future relationships, how you communicate, talking about consent with a partner regularly, you know, making it like, how do you show that you're turned on? For me, that's what I mean by trauma and trauma sensitive sex is really being aware of how nervous systems interact when they're together. Because they do too, right? We don't just have our own ladder. We're reacting to our partners uh, as well. Right. So. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So talk a little bit about masturbation, its importance, the kind of mindfulness you can practice with that. I still have friends that haven't masturbated, which is like wild. (laughs) It's 2020. I did go to college, high school and college in the South. So it gives you a little context, a little more shame and still here. Yeah. So mindful masturbation can be, again, totally unique to the person. I have like a little masturbation bingo that I like to give people to sort of challenge our brains to think about sex and pleasure in different ways. And so, you know, writing an intention before you start, you know, picking the video beforehand, picking a video that you've never watched before, having the lights on or off, really trying to change it up because especially for a body that's experienced and holding trauma, right? When we think about that trauma lives in our bodies, we have learned this so many times and in so many different fashions, but what does it look like when we try to undo the trauma in the body? We can do that with mindfulness and masturbation because we need to teach all three of these nervous systems how to experience pleasure and to not pull away or be activated by it, right? Right. And and that can be challenging for a body because – This one time when this sexual act happened, it was actually all of these horrible memories and 
my body is going to physically run away from it, even though my head is saying, I'm with someone I care about. I'm with someone I trust. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's about teaching all these nervous systems to sort of come back online and work together and be friends again. And so doing it in different environments, you know, even just lights on, lights off, that's a different, those are different chemicals being shot off in your brain, you know, less of this, your pupils are less or more dilated, and that can activate all sorts of really difficult physiological responses. So it's, it's practicing, really. And it's fun, right? It's also about <laughs> self you know, it can be all those fluffy things as well. But like my nerd brain is like, you're, you're helping yourself regulate, you're teaching yourself to experience pleasure, when, you know, pleasure, unfortunately, has been tainted with aggression, and oppression, right, right. And what I'm hearing in this is, so first of all, there's a variety of experiences that you're having. So you're getting out of a rut in your brain, right? The mindfulness, paying attention, tuning in seems really important. And then I would imagine you know, by doing this through masturbation instead of with a partner, right? There's benefit in exploring this alone and taking out a variable of another person's nervous system. Is that sort of how you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I worked with some pelvic floor physical therapy for a while and, um, you know, met a bunch of people through that and met two amazing practitioners. And, you know, they were saying the same thing, but from a muscular skeletal sort of (laughs) We've had trauma. This is what happens, you know, with the hip flexors. And so then that creates tightness in the uterus, which then creates tightness in the pelvic floor and the vagina and penetration can be painful. And like, really? And so I was hearing the same message, but with a different lens. And so that's that's why I put my own like sexual health is mental health spin on it because that's what it is, but it's also, you know, the nutrition that my PT was recommending to me was, was the same thing that my midwife friend was learning at Columbia. Hey, we're going to just take a short little break here. And I want to let you know about intimacy with ease, the method that helps otherwise happy couples create a sex life that is fun, easy, light for both people. So if you are an otherwise happy couple, if sex is the elephant in the room or sex is the little bit of the challenge for you guys, you may want to check this out. Uh, You can go to intimacywithease.com and you'll see information there. You'll see short videos. You'll have access to a full webinar about it. All kinds of information to let you know if this would be the right thing for you. So talk a little bit about then play. How does this go from a mindful masturbation practice where, you know, like you said, it's fun, but it also is like you're doing some work there, (laughs) you know? So the idea of crossing over bridging to play, to pleasure, to fun. All right. So you've done some mindful masturbation. You've done some solo work, which we know is so important, right? And you've been curious about yourself. And I use curious on purpose, right? curious, the desire to know without judgment. It's new and exciting, um, childlike curiosity. I really try to challenge that. It's hard for adult brains. Oh, we adult brains so hard. Um, one of my favorite movement professionals says, don't let your adult brain take over. So transitioning into play is like the next step because play is too nervous systems interacting at the same time. Okay. Now we're going to try to sync our nervous system. Two of our nervous systems are going to play together and we're going to try to sync with someone else's. So this is like, this is outside of the bedroom. So I sort of call it like naughty sort of play. Okay. And, And that's, that's what I mean because play is your social emotional engagement the top of your ladder, you know, you're connecting with people, you're making eye contact or not, depending on what game you're playing, right? And then you're the next step on the ladder in the middle, which is your um, sympathetic nervous system, right? That ability to either, you know, run around or whatever you're doing. So that's what I mean by play. And play can literally be anything your imagination can think it. That's the trickier part. (laughs) Right. So give us some examples of this, because especially said it's outside of the bedroom. So what kind of things are you thinking about when you, when you're talking about naughty play, if this is going to be sort of a step in the journey of the healing? Yeah. So naughty play can be really thinking about how do you build seduction? How do you flirt? 
and sort of like figuring out what that looks like for you and then incorporating that into play. And so, you know, I'll, I'll give a personal example. One thing that I like is I, I love to cook. It's just who I am. I love, I love being in the kitchen and making delicious food. It's just, it just brings me joy. So I really love, you know, being seductive with food. So I incorporate that, you know, and, and that can be just from walking over and bringing, you know, my, my human, a, a piece of whatever I've cooked and like, but forcing them to be mindful, taking a deep breath with them, mm-hmm. you know, telling them eat it slowly because it's the best, you know, whatever. Cause I'm amazing in the kitchen and you know, <laughs> whatever. And so, you know, it's about playing in that way, whatever that means. I mean, I've seen my parents make a game of Uno romantic uh-huh. and yet they're both yelling at each other, you know, like you cheated that third Yahtzee. That's, that's bullshit. I'm over it. You know, um, there's a lot of joy in play, but what's really great about play is there's awareness, right? That social emotional connection. Right. And so right. encouraging that is really important, especially within relationships for sure. Does it seem important to you that people do this outside of the bedroom? You know, somebody's had trauma outside of the bedroom before they start to play in the bedroom, you know, before they're actually Uh, in sexual encounters? Or do you see these happening, you know, simultaneously? I definitely think they can happen simultaneously. I don't think there's any like first, then this, you know, sort of thing. I think life is way too jumbled for anything <laughs> sort of linear, but I do, I do think that they can happen together, but prioritizing play outside of the bedroom, it builds seduction and who doesn't want more of that, you know, that can give you the energy for later or for the next morning, you know, depending on whose schedule and who sleeps when to sort of initiate more, you know, sexual sort of play. Yeah. Yeah. And I am imagining and thinking of some of my clients, if they've really, if trauma has really impacted their sexual relationship, that playing outside of the bedroom might feel like a, I want to say safer space to try to get all that hooked up again, right? To have access to their whole ladder. Yes, absolutely. To, and especially to get them fully in their bodies to sort of teach that, you know, I mean, think about the ways that we teach nervous system regulation to children. So I'll go back to some of my roots of like, I just kind of always found myself with kids. Hide and go seek, you know, like just the ability to hold your body still to understand that everyone can see you behind the sheer curtain, right? We're teaching a lot of things when we, we play hide and seek. And so, you know, playing games with your partner, partners, whoever, um, is really just it's a gift that you can give yourself because adults need to play more. We need to cultivate joy more, but also it can be a safe container for, let's say when things go wrong in a game and I get my feelings hurt because it looks like I'm going to lose and I can't, I can't pull out of it. I can't regulate and come back up to my adult brain and be like, it's actually okay because it is just a game, right? I've dropped <laughs> right. down in my, I'm in, I'm down in my bag. I'm in my feels. And then, There might be a moment where a partner just puts their hand on my shoulder and says, it's okay, babe, we can stop playing if you want. It's like, it's literally just a game. Yeah. What repair my nervous systems have just had, but also my relationship, you know, like the ability to be like, Hey babe, I can tell that you're, you're activated. Do you need a second? Do you want to take a deep breath? This is just skippo, you know, or yeah, this, yeah. this is just making, you know, us making dinner together and trying a new recipe, or this is us getting ready to go, you know, on another Zoom call in the times of COVID, right? It's like, it's not, not that big. It's okay. And then, you know, we can practice that because then we can practice that in the bedroom. When something goes wrong, the condom goes off, the toy was dead, the lube doesn't work, you know, <laughs> whatever is happening, that we can, we know that we can repair from that sort of like rupture, if you will. Right, right. Rupture connection. Yeah. How, I mean, what can the sort of, I want to say alternative world, but like poly, kink, even queer folks, sexuality, like how, how can that inform everybody about sexuality what do those worlds bring to this conversation they bring so much to the conversation they just can't be underestimated and they are often you know forgotten and 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 murdered i think of trans women you know showing femininity right that 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 sort of idea they cannot be understated because they give us so much insight into how we think about, about sex and i say we as like the collective we yeah um, you know specifically 
my experience, Western, white, you know, that sort of we, but really evaluating that. I think a lot about some of the people that inspire me. His name is A. Locke Minon, and he's on Instagram. He's a queer writer, artist, activist, performer, designer, um, and A. Locke is just a great mirror for us to all look at the ways in which, you know, just just alone binary thinking, masculine, feminine, limits the ways that we express our sexuality. I mean, those are just like huge blinders. It's almost a pinhole of sexuality is allowed to exist within the binary. Right. When, when you look at one queer couple and think about how they have sex and it just blows the minds of, you know, folks that don't, just can't imagine it. That alone are blinders. We have to we have to expand beyond the binary. We have to be building creative sex lives that make sense for the people in them, not the society structures that say what we should be doing during sex. So yeah, we have so much to learn from queer spaces. <laughs> I think a lot about, you know, how do how do we, you know, I say we queer folk, how do we sort of give that knowledge to our straight friends, if you will? You know, sort of like leading by example. Um, you know, sharing some of the struggles that we have, you know, using our ability to connect because we build communities. Queer folks know how to build families Um, because so many, you know, so many queer folks lost their families um, for being who they are. So I think about sharing that community of love as a way of showing, you know, chosen family love. You know, I have four siblings that are adopted. I'm not biologically related to anyone in my family and I love them just like anyone else loves their family. You know, those sort of things modeling what like radical outside the normal love, whatever that means is really important. And I think that can incorporate into sex lives too, you know? I'm sure you've seen that with couples who have had to work over gender stereotypes and, you know, sexism and marriages and relationships, and it hurts us. Yeah, I mean, one thing I talk about with clients, I don't know how to encapsulate what you're saying any better than you're saying it. <laughs> so, but, so, you know, I'll talk about how the idea of penis and vagina sex doesn't serve heterosexual couples. I mean, you know, even though they have a penis and a vagina, and that might be how they have sex, the limitations of that narrow framework and box and expectations is so limiting for people. And, and so the, the world of possibilities, getting out of the binary, getting into realizing there's freedom of, of choice for all of us, I think is, you know, it's so helpful. It just can't be understated, you know, like just that work of really understanding, you know, I mean, I think about like just some of the ideas that we have about sex, you know, if, if you know, couples thinking about anal sex, Great. Awesome. Let's learn about it. Let's learn about, you know, the first sphincter, the second sphincter, like this kind of toy, this is, this lube is better, you know, those sort of things. But if we're not also talking about the ways in which we were taught that our bodies were gross or the ways that we were taught that, you know, butt sex was related to HIV and gayness, then what are we doing? We're not really sort of unpacking the ways that our brains have thought about these things. Because I'm not saying we did not think this way. You know, this was this was by design, right? Like society and the pressure to conform. And so I think queer identities sort of say, yeah, whatever to that. And so that that can sort of give other identities, you know, this freedom of like, yeah, whatever. Like I can be a stay-at-home dad or, you know, I can be the wife who cuts the grass. And if my neighbors make fun of my husband for it, my husband and I are going to stand on a united front and be like, yeah, she cuts the grass. So what? You know, like small things like that affect relationships. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've heard them. I've seen them in dinner parties. I've seen them in my office. I've seen it walking through my classrooms. You know, they affect all of our relationships and I love that the queer community gives us this, like, look, people can have sex and there's no penis, you know, (laughs) those kind of things. It, you know, gives you the freedom to think outside what what was just put there, right? Right, right. Because you are that book of, like, there's a lot of stuff in your garden that you don't want, that wasn't there to begin with. You know, I think of growing growing up Catholic, 
the things that were told to me about my body and who had rights to it. You know, my body does not need permission from a priest, <laughs> right? Thank you very much. You know, but how that idea of thinking um, is so programmed and limits the ways in which we can be having really spiritual, connected, tantric, amazing, whatever sex. It can, there are better ways. There are better ways. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful for the queer community. They've given me a lot. So how can people find you, learn more about you? What, where, where do they go? Well, right now I'm uh, doing teletherapy and I work at uh, Institute for Human Identity used to be going to the village, but now I'm just doing it from home. So, um, but there's, you know, they're taking clients. Um, and then I'm also on Instagram at Cass Talks Intimacy. That's Cass.talks.intimacy. Or you can email me at Cass Talks int- Intimacy at Gmail. Yeah. And I'd love to stay connected with anyone or any other sex educator that's out there. Yeah. We're, we're family too. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your time. I mean it. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web and you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the better sex family. You can find a link at better sex podcast.com slash Patreon, which is P A T R E O N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.